May it please the court. I'd really like to slip right into the uh, merits of the attempted murder charge. <laughs> but I'd be willing to answer questions about the assignment of errors issue as well. Um, this, frankly, this argument about the attempted murder I thought was the stronger of the two arguments when I made the argument at the Court of Appeals. And an example I, I used at the Court of Appeals was a situation where I'm addressing you here today and I make a threat to harm you, to kill you. I get, I get a heated argument, I'm going to kill you, and I run back and I disable one of the uh, bailiffs who grab their firearm and come forward. By the time I get back, you all are gone. You disappear. And that is the situation I think we had here at the hearing household. Let me stop you right there. Isn't your grabbing the gun from the bailiff enough to... I think that's mere preparation, Justice. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what would be past mere preparation, then? Pointing the gun at you. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And that's, and that's that, the line you're trying to draw. Yeah, and I think uh, that's one of the lines I'm trying to draw. That's the most, I guess, the most illustrative of the ones I'm trying to draw. And I think that's the holding of the, the Sizemore case and, the, and the, uh, the cases coming before that, and that is, in those cases, uh, the, uh, the last proximate act before, not the court ruled that pulling the trigger, that firing the gun, is not uh, the last, last proximate act but that the pointing of the firearm would be the last proximate. And that's the illustration I'm trying to draw, and that's what I think, I think the situation in the Herring case is. There so let me go a little further. So if the sure. bailiffs were able to stop you on your way up here before you actually pointed at us, that wouldn't be an attempted... Uh, I would argue that it's not an attempted. Okay. You're gone. There's no one to point the gun. And that's what happened in this case. Mr. Herring clearly said twice to his wife, I'm going to kill you, or I want to kill you, over the car keys. Um, and he, he gets his gun and he runs outside and, he, and there's, there's no evidence there's no evidence that he saw where his wife was um, and there's evidence from the Commonwealth's witnesses that he didn't know where the wife was so he goes out on his front porch and he's got the gun he's kind of waving it around and it goes off he says it goes off in the air the father says it goes off after he, he uh, Excuse me, the defendant says he intentionally points the gun up in the air. The father says he jostles the gun, fingers on the trigger, and it goes off. But there's no indication that he ever knows that, that his wife is hiding under the truck out in the front yard. He doesn't go and try to, try to track her down. What if the fact that he doesn't know where she is, what if he just intended to spray the yard hoping to get lucky with that not be an intent? If he knew she was, in the, front, in, if he knew she was in the front yard. But I don't think in this case he even knew that she was in the front yard. I think it was the evidence that she, she left the house. And this is he's standing in the door talking to her. Oh, uh, he's yelling at her. As you okay. May, All you may, right. He's standing well, in the no, door yelling just, at her. Just what he said was, he's yelling into the night, where are my keys? Where are you? Where am I? I want my car keys. He doesn't, he doesn't know where she's at. There's no, no, none of the witnesses indicate, none of the Commonwealth's witnesses indicate. When he's standing in the door, counsel, isn't that one of the times when he tells her he's going to kill her? I'm going to yeah, have to kill you? He yells out, I'm going to kill you. He, he knows that she's outside. There's no question about that. He knows that she's outside, but he doesn't know where outside she is. <coughs> There's no indication in the record from any of the witnesses from the Commonwealth or the one defense witness that he knows where she's at. And so that that <coughs> is where I think that the court can... I know that in these attempt cases, that there are uh, there, the courts are loath to start picking them apart because there are, as the justice pointed out, there are many points within the, after you uh, after you make the intent of, of hurting someone, you know how how far what is mere preparation and what is the last proximate act? Counsel, based upon your argument, we do have to pick it apart to some extent. And I'm curious about your use of the passive voice with regard to the gun firing. As a court, we are not necessarily paternalistic, but it does remind me of my children when they were younger, and something bad would happen, and they would always report to me in the passive voice about that bad thing happening. That bad thing that happened. Yeah. Guns don't usually go off by themselves. I understand that it's possible, theoretically, for that to happen. But if the gun fired... Am I not allowed to come to the conclusion that he intended for the gun to fire? I think in this case, the defendant, I mean, in this case, the defendant actually said that he fired the gun into the air. All right, so I think you can intend it. 
you can infer that he intended okay. for the gun. He, he intended, he intended to get the gun. He intended for the gun to be fired. And he accomplished both of those. But he did not intend for the gun to be fired. I would argue that he did not intend for the gun to be fired at the intended victim. Okay. Well. I understand that's your argument. Okay. Uh, and it, in your argument, it sounds an awful lot like a, a substantive criminal law concept that you can't be found um, guilty of attempt if it was factually impossible. But that's not the argument that's made in the briefs. No, the, uh, I mean, you use that, that illustration, you know, the illustration, we're gone. So it's factually impossible to carry it out, so it can't be an attempt. No, I, I'm not sure that's the law anyway. Well, I'm not, said not, that, it sounds like that's the argument you're making. And let me, let me state this, that, that what the, uh, the illustration I made is that I stopped right here, right? And, and I don't try to find where you are in the building. And, this, and, and so that, at that point, the defendant has not taken the last proximate step to commit the crime. And I think that's the argument that, that, I'm, that I'm making. Not that it was factually impossible, not that there was no victim there, but he didn't point the gun at the victim. I didn't point the gun at, at you. But, but your argument was that they were part of the reason why it was he didn't know where she was. Right. Well, but that gets to the impossibility of performance. And I believe the substantive criminal law is, is that if you can't, if you can't commit the, the act legally, you can't be guilty of attempt. But if you have impossibility of performance factually, you can be guilty of attempt. I, I would argue that in this particular case, while um, it was factually, it was possible for him to complete the crime as he had stated, that because he did not and in fact, um, I'm not. Even, she, he didn't know that she was out there, but the fact that he didn't point the gun at her, that he did not complete that act, whether he knew where she was or whether he didn't know where she was, he did not point it at her. Well, but you know, Justice Powell, I asked a great question earlier. Suppose that he just he said knew he had an idea she was somewhere in the front yard and just sprayed the place. That was his intent to to kill her there with an overt act. So he's, he's actually discharged a weapon out there. He doesn't know exactly where she is, but he knows she's in the front yard. He thinks she's in the front yard. She doesn't actually have to be in the front yard as long as he thinks she's in the front yard to be doing that. So we have a guy who's discharged a firearm in the front yard after saying, I'm going to kill you. Again, I, I understand what the court is arguing or what the court is uh, is is asking. I believe that uh, you know, he evidenced his intent to hurt her by verbally. Gets the gun. And I'm not sure the record reflects that he knows that she's in the front yard. His statement is that he shoots the gun up in the air and he's trying to scare her into returning the car keys to him. Well, who, who's he talking to then? If he doesn't think she's in the front yard, well, she could. I, he, she, he knows that she's out there. She, she, he knows that she's outside the house. I'm not sure that he knew exactly where she was. And in this case, he didn't. I understand that, that he did not spray the front yard with, with gunfire. In fact, he, he was well, very right. well armed. That's a, that's a much larger. I understand. Example. But in this case, he was really well armed. Fired once into the air and then retreated back inside the house. And so. Uh, I think that's indicative of, of, I think that supports his argument at, at trial and that it wasn't an intent to harm his wife but to scare her to returning the keys, which were in fact inside the house. Well, for what it's worth, I think you have a better argument here than you did on the abduction, but that's another matter altogether. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I will reserve the rest of my time for a bottle if necessary. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court again. I, I intend to talk more about the merits here in this appeal than I did the other, but I do want to briefly talk 
about the assignments of error because we have some problems here as well. You, you have the initial assignment of error in the Court of Appeals, one and only assignment of error, and I'm not going to repeat the arguments I've made with respect to that. I mean, other than to say I think that was a bare-boned uh, assignment of error of the kind <coughs> that the court said was not involved in Finley. And so that's a starting point. The, the defendant then files a petition for appeal in this court in which presumably trying to shore up the infirmities that the Commonwealth had repeatedly hit him over the head with in the Court of Appeals, he has a uh, much more fleshed out assignment of error. He says that the Court of Appeals wrongly uh, wrongly denied or up the Court of Appeals um, erroneously held the trial court had not erred when it failed to grant defendant's motion to strike Commonwealth's evidence. And then he tracks the two elements of the attempted murder. Now, if that had been the assignment of error uh, or the equivalent of that in the Court of Appeals, I wouldn't have been challenging the assignment of error. So he clearly tries to up the ante and come up with an assignment of error that is sufficient, which I submit it was too little, too late to do that. Mr. Then, Hannon, he has to change the assignment of error from the Court of Appeals to here, doesn't he? Because he has to challenge the action by the Court of Appeals. Right. But, but certainly the reference to the Court of Appeals, I'm not challenging. But the, the last two-thirds of the assignment of error for the first time talks about the way in which the attempt might have been not supported, the, the elements of the intent might not have been proven. He'd never done that in the initial assignment. I understand. Of but then so that to, part... I understand all that, but then he have to deal with what the Court of Appeals oh, did? No, no question about it. And I'm not saying there was anything inappropriate about, about that. In fact, under the Davis case, he was duty-bound to do that. So that the first part of the assignment of error in his petition for appeal, no problem. It's the rest of it where for the first time he talks about the elements of the attempt not being proven, which he didn't do in the Court of Appeals sign of error. I say it was but too late for him to do that. Counsel, what's the harm? We, the only assignment of error that we are looking at is the one to us. But one, it, Is it insufficient? Well, one problem with that, Justice Mims, is there were two assignments of error he's filed in this court. There's the one he started out with in the petition for appeal that says the trial that the Court of Appeals wrongly did X, Y, and Z, and so and the trial court got wrong uh, the attempted murder uh, and firearm counts. But that, he didn't stop with that for reasons known only to the defendant. The assignment of error in his opening brief dropped the reference to the Court of Appeals. I don't know why, because under Davis, you certainly would have expected he would be talking about the claimed error of the of the uh, Court of Appeals till the cows came home. But he, for whatever reason, dropped it. To me, that's somewhat the equivalent of, I mean, in death penalty cases, you have all the time at the very outset of the opinion where the, the court will say, uh, these 12 claims, or excuse me, these 12 assignments of error were not briefed and therefore they're waived. This is not exactly the same thing. But the point is, you can't just constantly change the terms of the assignment of error. Again, we have three different versions of the assignment of error here. I, I just submit that the court would not wish to have a, a party proceed in such a willy-nilly fashion. We also don't know which of these two versions of the assignment of error the defendant that he's filed in this court wishes to proceed under. I know Does it matter? Because we're going to hold him to the one in the petition. It doesn't matter what he wants to do. Well, if you go... It's certainly to his great legal advantage to go with the one he filed in the petition for appeal. Well, it's not, I, I, I don't know what is to his advantage. I just know what we're going to hold him to. It's going to be the one in the petition. Well, that's, and, and, and that may well be correct. All, all I'll say is, at the very least, he muddies the waters when he drops the requisite reference to the ruling of the Court of Appeals. What waters he muddy? For whom? 
Well, I mean, you could view that as some kind of abandonment of a necessary element of what he said in the assignment of error. But let me, if I could, just move on to the merits. Well, before you do, let me just suggest that your problem is initially at the Court of Appeals because you said the original assignment of error was insufficient. You may or may not be right about that, but they disagreed with you. We have a rule that says we won't recognize any uh, matters that have not been placed before the Court of Appeals. Well, the Court of Appeals said it was placed before them. You didn't like it, but that's what the Court of Appeals said, and there's no other thing for this lawyer to do except to appeal from the Court of Appeals here based on what they said was placed before them. Right. So I, I think you ought to move on to the merits. Well, I, I, I will. I, I may misunderstand a part of Your Honor's question. I simply, very quickly again... Counsel, no, I don't think there was a question there. <laughs> Uh, okay, on the merits. I think the Court of Appeals correctly upheld the attempt. To, the firearm count obviously rises and falls with the attempted murder, so I'm not even going to talk about that. You had two elements. You have to have the specific intent to kill, and I don't think there's a very serious argument on brief about that. And he says multiple times, I'm going to kill you, Heather. And he's a man of his word, goes back to the, to the bedroom, comes out with a loaded shotgun, and then her father-in-law, the defendant's father, Tony Sr., says, get out. She flees outside and goes under the pickup truck, and luckily for her, doesn't get killed. But the, the defendant makes arguments that I don't think, particularly when you view the light, or the evidence in the light most favorable, to the uh, appellee, in this case the Commonwealth, I just don't think that they they fly. And certainly the trial judge's verdict of reasoning in convicting the defendant uh, so indicates. Let me just go through three or four things from the evidence that I think are, are critical to this. You, you have the defendant assaulting his wife, telling her he's going to get a gun and kill her. He retrieves the gun, comes back out towards the den. Then his father, Tony Sr., tells Heather to flee outside, which he does. Um, he then goes outside and shoots the gun. Now, one of the, the daughters, uh, who I think was 11 at the time, 12 at the time of the trial, McClellan, was in the locked bedroom, but she testified she was able to, to watch the defendant load the gun and the mother run outside. And she... I think this is Tony saying this at page 8, uh, Tony Sr. at page 46 of the appendix. The defendant was just looking to see if he could find her when he fired. Then, back to the daughter's testimony, pages 105, 106, the defendant, quote, was getting ready to pull the trigger, end quote, when Tony hit the back of it and shot up in the air. Page 62, I think that's from Tony. The gun had been aimed low. And then this is very important. I didn't notice this until this morning. The defendant has, no doubt, an inadvertent misquotation, but it's an important uh, misquotation on a critical issue here. This is a this, this 911 call was introduced, and at page 73 of the appendix, um, the 911 operator is called talking to to uh, caller two, who, if I remember correctly, was, was McClellan, but it's one of the two twin daughters. And near the, about two-thirds of the way down, the daughter says he was um, shooting it outside, but he wasn't shooting her. The quote in the brief, which I think is that, I have it written down here, I think it's somewhere around like page 8, does not accurately quote that. It says, quotes her as saying, he was shooting it outside, but he wasn't shooting at her. The word at is not in that transcript. Page 76, what is in the transcript is, the daughter says, um, he's trying to find another weapon, gun, yes, he's loading it now, he's loading it, and he already shot at my mom once. That is, a, that is an accurate quote. It says what it says. He already shot at my mom once. Um, 
Then, after the gun went off, uh, he again repeated he was wanted to kill her or was threatening to kill her. Uh, by the way, the defendant's own testimony uh, never once really disputed the fact he threatened to kill her. He said, well, people have their opinions and who's to say, and etc. And also, and I think there was a question to counsel that sort of picked up on this. As Connell's attorney aptly noted in the closing argument, the defendant's finger presumably was on the trigger, which is why the gun went off in the first place. Um, so I submit that this evidence certainly was sufficient to support the conviction. I would just briefly point out this case is somewhat equivalent to the Sizemore case. In each of these cases, the defendant was intoxicated. There, the attempted murder conviction was upheld based on such things as the procuring of a loaded gun, the act of aiming it, threats to kill, uh, act of advancing on the intended victim. The one big difference is there was never a shot fired there. There was one in here. Um, so I submit the evidence was sufficient. I just want two quick points at the end. At the end of his first paragraph of his argument, counsel says that the trial court plainly was wrong in denying the defendant's motion to set aside the verdict on this matter. There was no motion to set aside the verdict. <coughs> Absolutely not. I went to look at the clerks to make sure there wasn't some written document filed after trial that I was unaware of. No such written document. You read the transcript at the end of the guilt phase. You read the later transcript. There is no motion to set aside the verdict. Finally, the defendant says on brief something to the effect that the that the uh, aiming of the gun at the person can be the ineffectual act sufficient to support the attempt. The testimony I quoted in particular, the daughter's testimony, or not testimony, but statement of the 911 call at page 76, and he already shot at my mom once, satisfies his own stated test. So unless the court has any additional questions, I would ask the court in the event it reached the merits to uphold the Court of Appeals ruling on these two convictions and I will, well, I would just say I also have my uh, procedural arguments but I'd ask the court to affirm at least on this case. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal. Very briefly, uh, the uh, Page 73 of the appendix, uh, that portion of the 911 call referenced by counsel, um, the daughter goes on to state that, that she, the 911 operator asked, did she did put the gun up in the air? And she says, yeah, but, um, and then she, she, the daughter states to the 911 operator that, uh, that he was trying to scare her, presumably when he shot the gun outside. Um, there was another issue that was brought up in the other case, um, but what I wanted to uh, I failed to make clear is that the duration of this event, um, the council has referenced the, the time from the 911 to the time of the arrest, the 11 or quarter 12 in the evening was the time of the arrest. The, uh, the <coughs> testimony of Tony Hearing Sr. is that this event takes place in between 45 minutes to an hour. So just, I want to make sure the court had the context about when, how long this uh, event was going on. I, unless you have any other questions, I'll wait the remaining of my time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Court is adjourned. All right.